Welcome to the Couch GM Podcast, an awesome episode today as we have on Mark Lowe and Tom Lampkin. Mark Lowe was a relief pitcher in the major leagues from the mid-2000s up until 2016. Tom Lampkin was a catcher in the major leagues from the late 80s up until the early 2000s. Today's conversation stems around the home run race of 98, the home run race between Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire during that 1998 season, in which both of them were trying to break Roger Maris's single season home run record which at the time stood at 61 home runs in a single season. Mark McGuire would of course break Roger Maris's single season record as he would finish the 1998 season with 70 home runs. Tom Lampkin was on the St. Louis Cardinals during the 1997 and 98 seasons and we talked through some of those experiences that he had as a teammate of Mark McGuire as well as a friend of Mark. A big shout out to Mark Lowe for allowing us to film this podcast in his batting cages, which he calls the Grindstone. If you're near Southwest Washington, make sure to check out thegrindstonebaseball.com. Or if you'd like some one-on-one coaching with Mark, visit marklowbaseball.com. If you like to support the Couch GM brand, make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Find me across podcast platforms if you prefer to listen to the audio-only version. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy the episode. All right, welcome to another Couch GM podcast. Today I'm joined by Mark Lowe, who is a 11-year MLB vet as a pitcher, 15-year professionally in total, spanning from 2004 to 2007. And then I'm also joined by Tom Lampkin, who's a 13-year MLB vet as a catcher, uh, 17 years total professionally, spanning from 1986 to 2002. It's going to be a fun conversation. We're going to be talking mainly about the, the race of 98 and your experience playing with Mark McGuire and some behind the scenes. So first off, wanted to thank Mark for letting us do the podcast here in his, in his batting cages called the Grindstone. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit briefly about kind of what the spot is for? Yeah, no, um, just kind of took it on about five months ago and rebranded and kind of put some, put some paint on the walls and just getting some teams in here, giving lessons out of here and just watching uh, kids in Clark County, you know, just develop into a good baseball player. Awesome. So yeah, if you're around the Vancouver, Southwest Washington area, come check out the Grindstone in Vancouver. Uh, Matt, uh, Mark does lessons and you could just hit around. Tom, when I had you on the podcast last time, you mentioned that you could talk about, you know, the Mark McGuire race of 98 for an hour. So I was like, all right, I'm going to take you up on that. So right. <laughs> Mark's got to sit and listen to it, huh? Yeah. And <laughs> do you remember that? Oh yeah. No, yeah. I was a baseball fanatic. Like that was to me one of the greatest times in history to watch baseball like Mm -hmm. hands down got me hooked all my buddies hooked and you know it's kind of when baseball was starting to get on tv a little more with the sammy sosa mark mcguire and even Mm -hmm. griffey i mean i remember jeff bagwell back you Mm -hmm. know during the strike for me that's when i really got hooked was watching the killer bees yeah so you're like 15 16 around that age gosh i was probably younger than that okay 95 i was 12. okay yeah Cool. Yeah, that was it, man. And then Griffey and all that. And in 95, I think everybody could get behind that team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so wanted to start off, Tom, after the uh, 1996 season, after your seventh season in the bigs, um, you were traded from the Giants to the Cardinals. Do you want to walk us through what led to that, your first experience with the Cardinals? Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, what was my – I think it was really my first time in the Midwest playing baseball. The uh, – if you've ever played baseball in the Midwest, in Chicago or St. Louis, I mean, they, they love their baseball there, and they're very loyal to their teams. So it was a, it was a pretty easy decision to, to take that. I don't, was I traded, or was that a free agent deal? I think that might have been a free agent contract. From I what signed. I saw, you were traded from the Giants to the Cardinals. Okay. Could well, be wrong. I don't, I don't <laughs> remember. But um, I remember going there and just thinking what a neat baseball town it was. Okay. And so uh, from, that, from that point, it was, it, was, it was exciting to get going. Um, it was my first and only spring training in Florida, um, which was very different. If you've ever been to spring training in, in both, it's Arizona, in my opinion, is, is at least it was better for me and my family. But um, so going to Florida was a little different, but uh, but it was great. And, um, uh, you know, we we didn't start out real, real good that year. But um, uh, but playing in St. Louis was it was a treat. I mean, the fans were great. The, the town is great. Yeah, the yard was great. You get used to the humidity. I know, you know, people say, oh, it's so humid. But, yeah, I mean, 
you know, you expect to walk out of the clubhouse or your house and you just, it's going to be hot and it's going to be humid. So you just you expect it and you deal with it and, you know, you put your cold towels on and stuff like that. But it was a, it was a, um, it was a good time. It was a good time, good experience. Would have been nicer to win more early, but, uh, you know, in the halfway through the season in the, at the trade, trade deadline, I believe, was, was, was when we got McGuire and that was kind of when it all changed, at least the years I was there. Um, I think the year before they they went to the playoffs, it was a year before or two years before. I think it was a year before. So they were supposed to have a good team. We had we had a lot of components um, there for a good team, but for some reason we just uh, we didn't put it together. Um, but when he got there, it, it was kind of like a shift. You know, it was just it went from a um, well, we might not be winning, but we were the best team watching all mm-hmm. the baseball and, and in fact probably all the sports for for a while. Yeah, I, I remember. After the during the towards the end of the season, the um, and even after the season, the outlook they started talking about the home run record in the off season of '97, which was pretty incredible. So they kind of anticipated something was was coming up. Yeah, something was happening. They were talking about. It. I remember. I remember doing interviews in spring training about it. It, it was they, they they thought he was going to do it in spring training. I'll bet you could go back and find some interviews yeah. talking about him breaking the record in spring training in '98. And there's multiple documentaries talking about the race in '98. You know, I've watched most of them. Really interesting stuff, seeing the old footage and behind the scenes of, yeah, the the media coverage and how much. We'll get into the media coverage later on in the season, what that was like. Um, but so heading into 90, 98, um, was it believed that Sammy Sosa was going to be in it, or was it Ken Griffey Jr. versus Mark McGuire? <clears throat> yeah, I don't remember Sammy's name at all um, early in that. Um, I, I don't even remember offhand how good his years were leading up to that. He was a good player, a real good player, and he was a good hitter. But I don't recall what his, you know, home run totals or anything was before that. Um, in fact, I remember playing with Sammy. I, play, I played against Sammy in winter ball in the, Dominic, in the Dominican Republic in uh, would have been maybe 92, 90, 90, 89, somewhere in there. And uh, <laughs> I remember him back then. I mean, he came up with Texas, I believe. Good player. I mean, he was always good when he was young. He was like Bonds, you know. A little smaller, but he could run, he could throw, he could hit. I mean, his tools were good. Um, so he had all the, you know, the qualities and the recipe to become a, a good home run hitter um, and, a, and, a, and a really good player. But um, uh, but Junior was brought up that that year. Uh, in fact, Junior was probably brought up every year to do it, to break it for that matter. Um, that I had just uh, kind of gotten into, um, you know, where I was in the big leagues and from then on out in my career. So. Uh, I started to pay a little bit more attention to guys around the league, especially as much movement as there was. Uh, and I followed Junior a lot, but but he was definitely in the conversation earlier than Sammy was. Yeah, looking at Sammy's num- numbers the year was before, so 97, he had 36 home runs. The year before that, 40, 36. He was an all-star in 95. So he was starting to put up numbers, but yeah, from everything that, I, that I've seen, he was more of a swing and miss type guy to where he wasn't hitting as many home runs as the the, the Maguires, the Griffies. What what do you you remember before that? I season? remember Frank Thomas being in the mix too. Frank Thomas was he not? Uh, he might have been. He yeah. was one of the guys. I mean, yeah. I just remember that there was a crew of like maybe three to five of them where you know they all had their own shoes coming out, and it's you know the home run derby. Yeah. You know the All Star games was just fun to watch. Um, but I remember Big Hurt being in there. Big we Hurt. usually ended up we called him the Big Skirt later on <laughs> when I got into the league, but. Um, yeah, he was fun to watch, too. That's awesome. And, yeah, I mean, McGuire, before he joined uh, the, the Cardinals, I believe, was an all-star nine times. So having a guy with that pedigree coming over to your team, what, what were the vibes in the clubhouse in 97 and then heading into 98? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think overall they were probably pretty good. I think there might have been um, – there, there, you know, you start to get – you got some egos in there. Right, I mean, honestly. And you had and, just played with Barry Bonds in San Francisco. Well, yeah, I played with Barry, and and you know when Dion came over, I think that there there might have been a little bit of that kind of comparison, and you know, I mean, and, and not that it, it wasn't rightfully deserved. I mean, that was Barry's team, I and mean, Barry had done tons for the game, tons for the city, tons for for himself, and you know, I mean, he was just he was the guy, and you know, you get another guy come in like that, and it 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 can present sometimes a pretty awkward dynamic and not that not that they didn't get along you know but 
Um, but you know, you got McGuire coming into a team where we had, I mean, we had some superstars on that team. You know, we had uh, Ray Langford and Brian mm -hmm. Jordan and Willie McGee and Dennis Eckersley, and we had some older guys. You know, we had Rick Honeycutt was on that team and um, Gary Gaetti. I mean, we had some, mm -hmm. we had some, some, some big names on that team, and uh, uh, you know, so to have him come over was was good because he knew a lot of those guys. But you know, it's it's you, you don't know how the dynamics going to work out till he actually gets in there. And he was one of Tony's guys too. You know, Tony was our manager, and he had brought him in. And you know, uh, 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 our and our GM was um, uh, oh gosh, now it's it's killing me now. Um, uh, Got to cut this part so it doesn't look like I'm. <laughs> Struggling so far no, you're to find good. him. Uh, so, what's his name? Um, super, super guy. And I want to say he might have been in Oakland. You might want to check that. He well, that's that's what I was Oakland. just about to say. All the guys you just named, they all came from that Oakland organization. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And that's um, they were a powerhouse. Interesting. You know, late 80s? And yeah. Was it 88, 89? When uh, Oakland yeah, they, was playing he, San his, Fran in the World Series? Yeah, I think I think, I think think McGuire was 87. I think he was rookie of the year in 87. Him and Conseco came in in '87, I want to say. Um, yeah, but I, I think yeah. I think that Tony's crew, a lot of Tony's crew, Walt Jockety, that was his name. Um, I can't remember if Jockety was from Oakland. Maybe he wasn't. But I mean, he assembled you know the group, and they they did they you know they had a really good run in St. Louis there for a long time. And um, but when but when Mark came over, he was kind of one of Tony's guys. So I think. Uh, I think that sometimes, you know, you're, you know, I think that might have had a little, uh, there might have been some people that, you know, thought that that might have, you know, been a little weird. If, you know, he wanted to bring one of his guys in because he didn't, you know, trust maybe some of the guys that we had there. I think there's, that's always part of it. But, you know, our, I mean, John Mabry was our first baseman. Mm -hmm. He had a, he had a great major league career and I, I, I think he's coaching now somewhere. And um, we, uh, Jack Clark was there. Yeah. There's, there's another guy. I mean, yeah. we, we had, there were some good guys on, old guys, veteran guys on that team. But it was good. It was good. It was a. It was neat to have him come over, and he he definitely threw a spark into our, um, onto our team for sure. That was the game back then. They, you held on to veteran players. Yeah. Like I remember growing up, and then watching that, and then getting called up for the first time and becoming a veteran. I'm like, man, I could do this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then everything changed. You know, the the veteran players were, you know, we can get just as much out of a young guy. So you hold no value anymore, and they kind of started ball. spitting guys yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and kind of just keep reloading the young players as much as they can. It's kind of the game now. Yeah. So in uh, September 1997, Mark McGuire signed a three-year contract extension with the Cardinals. So you guys kind of knew that you had this window, um, you know, just him being a part of it. You also mentioned all those other guys on your, on your team. So you move into spring training. There's publicity about the home run race that might be happening this year. Walk us through those first few months, you know, as, as it was happening. <clears throat> Well, I remember <clears throat> Mark and I, um, we got pretty close in spring training, I think, um, mostly because we both like to eat, you know, and, and, and I, I've always been a kind of a big eater and a, a, a steak and potato yeah. guy. And so uh, we found out in spring training that we kind of liked the same foods and we, we ate about the same time and things like that. So um, we ended up going out to dinner a lot, you know, especially um, on the road and in spring training um, after – you know, after workouts or, or late, late nights during spring training and more, um, you know, at lunch during the season. But, um, but we started talking a lot and he would a lot of times fill me in on things that were happening that I didn't know about, whether it was interviews or what people say or magazine articles that were written. And next thing you know, I mean, it's just like every day in spring training, they were talking about this record every day. I, I'll bet you could find something it was it was unbelievable it was like he had season hasn't even started yet how do you know he's gonna do this you know i mean okay he's got he's got 40 or 50 or 30 i mean those are big numbers but they're not 70 you know right, and, right. and mm -hmm. it's like what makes you believe i mean that you're he's gonna hit 70 this year or 61 or whatever it was yeah but they talked about it and i'm, I'm telling you man i mean you know the way it is as a pitcher when everybody in the ballpark expects something to happen, it's got a better chance of happening than if they don't expect it to happen. You know, right. I mean, he walked up to the plate, and everybody, in my opinion, everybody, including the pitcher, expected him to homer, <laughs> you know, and everybody did. And, and it's just like walked up, we stopped what they were doing, they got up to the fence because they knew he was going to hit a home run. This was early. This was early. But 
I think one of the reasons, I think one of the things that was so cool about it was these weren't just, you know, run of the mill, over the fence home runs mm. where the guy goes back and, you know, <laughs> can I get a can? No, I'm not going to get it. These are 100 feet over the fence. These, these aren't even close to being not home runs. I mean, they're, they're, half of them were, you know, over the seats, out of the stadiums, through the roof, you know, whatever. They, they weren't even close to being not home runs. Yeah. And, and so you, now his batting practice became spectacles, right? Because yeah. he, would, he, would hit him, he would hit him 100 feet over the fence in batting practice. It's just like you just yeah. – you just didn't see that. Nobody saw that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean, you know, Junior and Sammy and, like you said, Frank Thomas. And there were a bunch of guys in the league that were homering at that time. You know, not just, not just Mark. But, but, th- but this was a, it was a different – it was on a different scale. And so um, I, think, I think that's kind of where it, it, it really started getting excited, exciting early because we started seeing that early in spring training. Yeah. I remember going uh, to an Astros game. Uh, grew up in Houston, and you, did you play with Terry Poole? Uh, I played against. Him. Okay, so his son was one of my best friends growing up, and so we would get you know some Astros tickets along the way. And I remember wanting to go during that time when the race was going on, and we got to go against watch Mark McGuire when Randy Johnson was pitching. Oh, man. Randy had just come over from <clears throat> Seattle to Houston. I think it was '98. Actually, no. it wasn't. No, he was. Uh, Randy was in Seattle in '98. Okay. He he, because I because my first year in Seattle was '99. Okay. And that was Randy's first year. In gotcha. Houston. Okay. So '99. Um, okay, so maybe it was '99, but I remember we were I don't know four or five rows back, just seeing how big McGuire was, and I'm going, what in the world is this? <laughs> yeah. And Randy is throwing a hundred from here, and he hit a ball that almost hit the back wall. On the, at the top of the upper deck in the Astrodome. And it never was coming down. It was still going up when it hit the seats. And in, in my entire life, I've never seen a ball hit like that. And it went out fast. Like, it was just a straight line drive. Just a different human being. Yeah. Well, you know, his, his, his pop-ups were homers. His line drives were homers. And his, the balls that he really hit good were so far yeah. out of, you know, over the fence. So, really, he, he had to really miss a ball. For, for that to not go out. Yeah. And, the, you know, he was, he was really good inside, mm-hmm. really good inside. I mean, for a guy that big that stood that close to the plate, mm-hmm. he kept his hands inside the ball. So he kept so many balls on the inside part of the plate fair that you just don't see. You just don't see that. You know, a guy that stands on the plate that much, I mean, you want to pound guys in like mm-hmm. that to get them to speed their bat up, you know, get them to start flying open a little early. Yeah, down and away is down the middle. Yeah, he when just, he stands on top of the plate God, like that, he just he killed balls like that. So you try to throw him away. I mean, he'd get his arms extended, and yeah. you know he juice you straight away or right center. I mean, it didn't it didn't matter. It, it really didn't matter. I mean, he'd really have to miss a ball for it not to go out. Yeah, it, it, he was, and he was locked in too. I mean, there's you know there was that factor. You know, we all go through times in our careers where. You're just seeing the ball good. You feel good. You 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 know you know you're going to get a hit when you walk up to the plate. And he he had that a lot. I remember him maybe having a couple little you know two or three game stints where he didn't swing the bat good, but there weren't many of those that year. I mean he was he was hitting multiple home runs a game a lot. <laughs> and um, first off, do you know how big his bat was that he was swinging? Yeah, he's he swung a 35 inch bat, 35, 33. I want to say I've got one. I've got one at home. I could, man, I could, I could show it to you. It was a log. Jeez. 35, 33. I think it was. And then something also I noticed with his, uh, you know, swing, he had the bat down like by home plate when the pitcher was like part way through their motion. He was like swinging the bat down here. And then by the time they were like releasing the ball, he was coming back and ready to go. I mean, yeah, that was his timing mechanism. Yeah. You know, everybody's got a different one and that's what, that's what he felt comfortable doing. He did it in, Batting practice, he did it when we were doing our front toss work and when he was, you know, anytime he would be in. His, his batting practice was a, I mean, it was a routine. It, was, it wasn't just get in there and try to hit the ball out of the park, although he might have had a, a round or two when he did that. But, but every swing he took the same. I mean, his, his, his approach was the same. His pre, you know, pre-swing was the same. His timing mechanisms were the same, as they are with most guys. You know, that wasn't unusual. 
but 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 he it wasn't he didn't just get up there and try to hit the ball out of the park every time i mean he his first round he'd take the ball the other way and and a lot of them went out of the park but he 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 definitely worked on letting the ball come back into the zone bef- you know and taking it to right field before he you know turned on balls like most guys do so mm-hmm. it was very you know i mean it was very typical um you know pre-game warm up and batting practice for him but uh, but he was very methodical at it yeah, looking at his career numbers, so 97, he had 58 home runs. 90, 1996 was the first time he broke 50. He had 52 home runs. So, yeah, 97, you know, he was only three away from that record. And then he's coming in to the 98 season with so much hype. So the first couple seasons, it's really the, the grippy McGuire hype. At what point does it start to turn to where, hey, who's this guy, Sammy Sosa, that's now up in the race? <clears throat> you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly when that was. Um, I, I think it was midsummer. I think maybe when it st- we started to realize it, but they were they were rivals of ours, right? They were. Right. I think we were in the same conference at that time, and um, so we played them a lot, and, and there was always talk about it. But I, I don't remember. I just don't remember ever it being that big of a deal until I think they all got to fifty, because I think Junior was in the race at fifty at that time. It, they were all separated mm-hmm. by a home run or two right around that fifty mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't really remember it being that much until that time. And we were still trying to win. I think, you know, once we realized that um, we were, you know, we were, we weren't, we might not have a shot at the division. Was was really when um, it really the race really started turning to the home run more than it did, you know, trying to win games. But no, I mean, we still tried to win games. But I think the focus really kind of went more to Mark than it did on the team at that time. Looking at some of the dates, so at the end of July, Mark McGuire had 46 home runs, Sammy Sosa had 42, Ken Griffey Jr. had 39. At the end of August is when things really started to tighten up between Sammy and Mark. Uh, Mark had 58 home runs, uh, Sammy Sosa had 51, and then Griffey had 46. So I guess as a teammate of Mark McGuire, um, what was the atmosphere like in the clubhouse as that record started to approach, as the, the race started to intensify? What was it like going to the ballpark, being in the city, you know, just knowing that everyone's watching this? Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Um, I mean, just walking through the town was was crazy. I mean, every but it's St. Louis. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you played there. Everybody wears red in, in mm-hmm. St. Louis, and everybody is out in the in that. In, I don't know where it is now as much as it was when we were there, but. Um, they had like a, a big open square. I can't remember what the name would that, that had a bunch of grass. And so people used to have picnics out there and all the time. I mean, it was a, they just love Cardinals yeah. games and they were very supportive. And yeah. so I don't know what it was like any other time because I was only there those two years. But as going in as a visiting player, it was always like that. You know, they are just, they're just such a great, it's such a great ball, baseball city. Um, they understand the game. Yeah. Like you get a runner over there as a visiting player, they applauding you yeah. you know for playing the game the right way sack bunt that's right yeah they, I mean, they, they didn't boo the opposing team no. they cheered the opposing no. team I mean, they were just they're wonderful yeah they're just Class great acts. fans you yeah. know and and um so i i really don't know how how different it would have been if that wasn't going on but um in the clubhouse yeah it, it was kind of i guess it, it was kind of business as usual because you still everybody's got their own jobs to do and you still got to perform and you know, you still got to, you know, everybody's trying to, to do something, their part to win the games. You still got to go to meetings to prepare and you go to hitters meetings and the pitchers meetings and, um, you know, you work out and you go hit and you go eat. And I mean, all, all that stuff's kind of the same, but I, you know, there, there was always that, at least for me, there was always that, you know, you talk with a couple guys on the team saying, you know, so-and-so's pitching, oh shit, it's actually going to Sorry, he's actually gonna hit. He's, he's gonna hit two today, you know. Or, you know, he, who's he got out of the pen? Oh, he's got another two there. Should he get four today? You know, I mean, you just that that was kind of always in the you know the back of our minds because that was kind of what was taken over the. That was baseball, really. I mean, I remember my dad. He was over in uh, Japan a lot uh, with his job, and he used to say that they used to cut into games over there and, and put McGuire's at bats on the TV wherever he was and. <laughs> I mean, everybody would do that. Restaurants, you know, they'd, they'd have TVs in the meeting rooms and they'd cut into his at-bats. And, I mean, this was a worldwide deal. This wasn't just going on in St. Louis. And so I think we were we kind of, we'd be foolish to think that that wasn't, you know, we couldn't really talk about it. And mm-hmm. we did. We joked about it a little bit. And, um, 
I mean, it, how, it, ma- how many years had it been since that record of 61? 61. I mean, how many years? 61. It had been 61. 61 and 61. Oh, uh, okay. Because that was I mean, that's a long that, time. Well, that was a year that uh, DiMaggio had his 56-game hitting streak, right? I think that was the same year. Yeah, so let me see here. So it had um, stood for, let's see. I don't have that fact. I could look that up. But, uh, yeah, he broke it September 8, 1998. Uh, yeah, it surpassed Roger Maris. I don't have the exact date that I think Roger it was Maris 60, had. I think it was 1961. I'm 1961, almost sure about it. 61, I think DiMaggio hit his 56-game hitting streak uh-huh. in, in, in the same year. Gotcha. And because I think that I think he didn't win the. I think I think DiMaggio won the. Uh, from what I remember, something like that. He won the the MVP award because of his 56-game hitting streak, and Maris didn't win it after he broke Ruth's mm-hmm. record. I believe. That's, that was kind of the and then you saw the the prior couple years with Aaron Judge uh, breaking the AL home run record. Yeah, you know you saw the Maris family um, yeah. in the limelight again because Aaron Judge broke the AL record. Um, yeah, I guess what were your thoughts or at what point did it pick up on your radar? Were you already already locked into Martin? McGuire? I mean, I was just a huge baseball fan, yeah. so it was like, like I said, as a fan, you you were so into it that. I mean, me and my brother and even our whole family would just sit around the TV. Think, or what was this week in baseball mm-hmm. was uh, a Saturday thing. You know, we wouldn't get – they would black us out on uh, Astro games, you know. So the only one you would really get are these weekend games. It would be the Cubs versus the Cardinals. Typically all the time it would be Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. And you just drop everything you're doing on that Saturday and you're, walk, you're watching uh, – who ran that show right before um, – the guy who dropped his his pants to clean off. Remember when Lenny he Di- was it, uh, not Lenny Dykstra was. Uh, no, it was. Uh, 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 what was his name? Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. He was slid uh, into first. Kid from Chicago. That was Chicago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <sighs> but he was the one who ran the show, and they did like a, yeah. a full hour of just like, yeah, you know, talking to the name. players and okay. seeing what they're doing behind the scenes yeah. and like showing batting practice and just seeing what they're like away from the field. And you never. In that time in the world, like, you didn't see that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like it is now where you have, you know, iPhone everywhere and everything you do. You can see who that person is. You can follow them on Instagram. Yeah. YouTube channel. None of that existed. So, as a fan, like, that was out there. I was in. And I was watching. And you become a bigger fan just knowing that, hey, that's a human being, not just a superstar. And you get to know that person. So, for me, it was just amazing i was all in um saturdays we're right in front of the tv watching those games then we go out and imitate mark mcguire you know getting ready for the pitch and it never worked for me but i was gonna say you're a lefty so you're probably imitating i was a lefty but i so growing up we would do you know we would imitate and i would hit right-handed too just when i played a game it was left-handed but i would i had all these lineups memorized and we would go in the front yard and i would go one through nine and just hit just like every single guy (laughs) that's awesome um and then you're hitting the record on the vcr you know, because that's the game you're going to watch all week. And that's yeah. what we did. Awesome. So then, I guess, uh, kind of handling the media as it intensified throughout the season, what what did you see with, uh, you know, you knew Mark off the field? How did that start to affect him if it did? And you know, what was his mindset throughout the year? Um, no, I don't think it really affected him. It was definitely a factor. It it, it was It was present, you know, at restaurants and – you know, um, you know, waiting for cabs and stuff more more so than it usually is in places like that. Um, but he was always, he was he was really even keel about it. You know, it never really got to him that much. He he couldn't understand why people would you know follow our cabs down the streets. <laughs> you know, which yeah, I mean, I I get why they were doing it, but yeah, it's kind of you know, I mean, it's not like we're gonna stop and ask you to come in or anything. I mean, yeah. you know, we're going to the yard, <laughs> right? But but I, I mean, I, I understood that it happened, and but he was he was great at it, and you know he did his interviews, and um, he was usually pretty gracious about talking to the media. But you know there were times that it was time for him to get ready, and when it was that time, he was getting ready, you know, mm-hmm. and and so media would go somewhere else. They'd come talk to me a lot of the times, you know, about something that they wanted to know about him. But for the most part, he was he was very gracious with them, and you know answered their questions, and even though. They were very repeated, a lot of them. I mean, how much can you talk about really yeah. the same thing over and over? But, um, 
but he he was he was great he was great with it and I think um, towards the end there uh, you know end of August early September it was it was it was more of a burden on the guys in the clubhouse because the the media attention f- started kind of flooding over into the clubhouse instead of the media room you know or or you know and in St Louis um, the clubhouse was right in the center of of the locker area. I mean, there was a, you know, the training room was off that, the manager's office was off that, the dinner was off that, the bathrooms were off that, everything was off the center of that. Whereas in like Seattle, you know, you had the clubhouse down the hall and then everything else was down hall. So it was kind of, you know, um, you were sectioned off a little bit better. But in St. Louis at, at Old Bush there, they were, it was right in the middle of everything. So, I mean, you had to walk through the media to get to everything. And, and it was a circus there for the last couple of months, a circus. Mm-hmm. But they were respectful pretty much of Mark, but they would just hang out. I mean, it was nothing to walk in the clubhouse and you couldn't see across the room. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you add on the, the people that wanted to come and see him, which, you know, for guys like us, you know, it was kind of cool to meet, you know, different people in the sports world or the celebrity world. You know, I, I got to meet the guys from Pearl Jam. That's when I met the guys mm-hmm. from Pearl Jam for the first time. And you know, I still talk to those guys, you know, to this day. Um, so that was cool, and some of the guys from from other 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 walks of life that you got to meet, that was kind of cool. But you know, you'd walk in there and you couldn't see across the room. And there was, I mean, it's it like, you know, there were fifty, hundred people in there. So yeah. it, it got to the point where there had to be something done, and so then they started, you know, putting restrictions on who could come to the clubhouse, what time, and then the media would fight back saying, well, you know, we're supposed to be, and well. You know, we can't. Nobody can do their job with you guys here. So uh, they were pretty good for the most part. But everybody was trying to get a story. I mean, it was a it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, but Mark did he did great. I mean, obviously he did great. I mean, it, it could have very easily derailed him and Sammy the same way. I can only imagine what it was like in in Chicago. You know, I mean, Chicago's more of a media frenzy than St. Louis was, although and way, I don't know how it could have been. A but, way bigger clubhouse, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But typically, you know, typically it's, it, uh, yeah, you know, the visiting one, did, did you so ever play it already? Oh, yeah. oh, oh my yeah. God. It was terrible. It was horrible. So bad. Tiny. Yeah. But some, oh, yeah. And, and yeah. some of the, you oh, know, yeah. some of the visiting clubhouses are, are, are smaller, and but St. Louis, even the home side of St. Louis wasn't huge, but when you get that many people, it it really doesn't. And then you got, you know, you got your 30, you know, 25, 30 guys that are, you know, trying to get dressed and right you know people walking back and forth clubhouse guys it gets crowded yeah and myself being up at, at the mariners games <clears throat> standing on the sidelines you know trying to get interviews i empathize with the players because putting myself in their shoes you know they're trying to get ready for a game and me over there like you know their head down tunnel vision you know trying to get into the clubhouse so it's like you got to pick your spots to mm-hmm. try and engage because i can only understand I can only imagine what it's like for a player to try to get ready. <clears throat> you know, here's here. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what bothers players, and and I, I I'm I'm not speaking for you, but I, I I bet you you're along the same lines. The thing that bothered players was, at least me was, and, and Mark, and and most of the guys I played with that would, would get together and talk about stuff like this is when they get when they when when people feel like they're entitled to talk to you at a certain time whenever they want without regards of what you're trying to go about doing. That's when it bothers guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if I'm getting ready to walk into the cage or if I'm getting ready to do something where it's time for me to focus or whatever, I, I don't have to talk to anybody at that time. And to have somebody assume that, Hey, I have a media pass. You need to talk to me. I mean, that attitude is there. I mean, people do that. And that's where guys get the bad names. It's not the people that, you know, put their time in early and they stand aside and say, hey, when you have a second, I'd, I'd really like to talk to you. Those are the guys. Well, OK, I mean, that's the guy that I'm going to talk to. Mm-hmm. And he's going to be able to get my attention before a guy that just assumes that I, I have to talk to him, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I know for me, <clears throat> especially um, somebody wants to talk and, you know, they just I'll, I'll, as soon as I can break away, I will. And most of the guys were really like that. I don't think anybody really, with the exception of maybe a handful of guys, just they just didn't want to they didn't want to to talk to the media most guys were willing to they just they just had you know they didn't want to feel like they had to do it at that person's time on that person's timeline yeah and I know that as you build a rapport with the players you get to know certain reporters you might Mm -hmm. end up walking up to someone versus another person for those exact reasons that you're talking about um yeah did you have the same kind of experience yeah no I mean 
it, it's right on for me, my, my kind of whole perspective on that. And it went along the same as signing autographs. Um, you know, I was around good guys that I would go to the park with, I mean, superstars, all-stars, and just watch how they dealt with, with fans. And you could see which ones really were thankful to be in the situation that they were and would stop and sign. And just heading into the park, you got a crew of people waiting. I mean, prime example, Joe Nathan would sit there and sign for an hour just before he went into the park every day. And one thing he always said is just don't forget yourself as a little kid giving anything in the world to have somebody ask you for your autograph. And I never forgot that. And I felt the same way with the media. It's like they have a job to do. Whether I'm going to read it or not, which I 100% of the time didn't, um, just because it wasn't my thing. I mean, we had guys that would just throw the newspaper in the trash. You know, it'd be sitting on the on the island right when you walk in they just toss it in the trash because what's the point of reading it yeah. you know how the game went you know if you did good or not um so for me it was like you know i was a short reliever you know throwing one inning hopefully three times a week so there wasn't much to say yeah so my um experience with the media was way different than mark mcguire yeah <laughs> to say the least um so my moments i was like all right they want to talk to me let's go so i was always tried to be available for him, but I never really had any bad experiences. Um, maybe a couple, but it wasn't anything even memorable. How was the Jose Bautista coverage during the playoff run that year in Toronto? No, oh, I mean, great. I mean, so that, what you're talking about, just the locker room, just the buildup of people. I mean, I experienced that so many different times, just from being on good teams, going to two World Series, that's how the clubhouse is. You know, that's nonstop. It's just, I can't imagine that for a full season and never getting a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. and having to deal with that. And it's the same people every single day. <clears throat> um, so I'm sure that could totally wear on you and to, to be the guy in the spotlight, to keep your head on straight and to still go about your work the right way and, and be respectful of people. And then I, I actually got to, uh, to meet Mark McGuire. He was a coach with the Dodgers when I was in camp with him and just a wonderful human being, um, salt to the earth, just had time for everybody. Didn't matter who you were. Um, so it was cool to see that, you know, as being a fan growing up and then getting to meet people like that and just going, man, what a great person. Yeah, that's awesome. Did, did you guys ever break away and just make some steak and mashed potatoes at home to avoid going out at all? Um, <laughs> you know, at home, we didn't we didn't do much together at home. You know, he had his uh, he had his people. He had some I know his, his son was there a lot and. I can't remember if, if his girlfriend was there a lot at the time, but um, or his, his wife. I, th I think it was his girlfriend. But uh, and then my family was there, so we didn't do a ton at home. There were times that um, you know we went out, and I can I can remember going to eat with them, with him, him and, and his kids, and my family. I can I can remember doing that, but um, a couple times. But most of the time it was on the road. So <clears throat> that's pretty standard throughout the league. You yeah. just you're at home, you're with your family because yeah. you spent. 12 days on the road, Makes you sense. know, yeah. with the whole team. So <clears throat> just kind of how it is. You go on the road, let's go out to dinner and get a whole crew of 12 guys and go out for dinner and whoever makes the most money pays for it. Great. Yeah. Is that how it works <laughs> or do the rookies have uh, to face sometimes? I mean, that'll happen once, but yeah. um, it's usually a joke. They make it act like they pay for it, but it doesn't end up happening. Okay. Yeah. They have the moment of shock. Like, yeah, I can't actually, yeah, here's the that. bill for three grand and you haven't been paid anything. <laughs> yeah. Right. You got that money coming in. Come on. That's now. right. Play credit card roulette and they somehow lose every single time. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So can you walk us through just some memorable moments that you remember from 98? You mentioned spring training. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember, uh, and I don't remember what, what month it was, but there was a there was a time in the summer that one of my brothers came out to St. Louis. I don't remember if he had a business trip or if he was just out there or visiting. But one really cool thing about St. Louis and and Walt Jockety was was really the 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 spearhead behind this. But they were a very family oriented club, which was great. And and I'm sure you can you can attest to that when you you find an organization and they're all different. You know, yep. some are some love to try to keep the families together, and um, others are more hey, this is the team, we need to keep focus, we need to, you know, no, no wives on the, on the flights, no families on the flights, and, and then other ones are, you know, families can fly, wives can fly back, or, you know, they always have these different rules. Some of them would have buses for the families at games, some wouldn't, but 
St. Louis was very family oriented. So um, that made it easy on me because my wife and kids were there. So they were, they were with us a lot, even on the road, which was great. Um, and I, but I, so when my brother came to town, um, they, the, the Cardinals would let your, if you had a, um, like a a brother or a a son, I think it was just, just male. I can't remember, but you could take them onto the field. You'd give them a uniform and they'd go on the field during BP. Uh, and so, cause a lot of guys would bring their sons out and which was really cool. You know, I mean, they, they wouldn't get in the way, but they, they get to experience that. So I remember I got my brother a uniform and we were out at, at Bush stadium. We were out in, um, in the outfield for batting practice. Cause you know, the hype was there, right? I mean, it, like we saw earlier, it started in spring training. So, so I remember he came out and it was during the summer and we were standing and I said, okay, well, you, you got to stand in like right center. That's the best place to watch his batting practice because you, you can see the line drives go over, you can see the long ball and you can see the high ones, but the, the trajectory is good to view from right here, you know? <laughs> And I remember he, w- he was standing there next to me, or we were watching him take BP from there, and he was just like, you know, the, the, first of all, if you've never been in a big league stadium, when you walk onto the field, yeah. it, it's, it's totally different than looking at it from the yeah. stands. Mm-hmm. It's just a different feeling. It's big, it's tall, the fences look further away. Just like anything, I'm, I'm sure, you know, any sport, but when you walk onto a baseball field, it, it, it's big, it's, it's, a big it's a big facility. And he couldn't believe how big it was. And, and then you watch how far over the fence these balls are going. And he, he just, it's a once in a lifetime deal to, to be able to watch that. And I, I do remember that specifically, that one batting practice that he got to come and, and watch. Um, and there, there were other times. Um, I remember we were on the road one day and uh, we were in Chicago. Uh, and, and I don't remember when in the season it was, but it was, it was getting late again. And we went to eat, we went to lunch at, um, at this place in downtown and it was a steakhouse and we it might have been it might have been yeah it had it would have had to been before the game so i called ahead of time i had a lot of you went steak and potatoes pregame i'd have as much as i could i'd I'd eat as much as i could pregame take a a quick power nap before maybe (laughs) so so we we went to the it it, might have been after a game but use it might have been after a game that we had it, but I, I thought it was before. Anyway, I would call the restaurants ahead of time and just say, hey, you know, we need a table for two. I'm with, you know, Mark McGuire. It's going to be a, a zoo. Can you, you know, and so they were, and of course in Chicago especially because they knew what was going on there. Like, yeah, okay. So they would, you know, usually they would have those ropes, you know, off, and they would rope off a section. And then I would call ahead of time and say, hey, we'll, you know, we'll be there in 10 minutes. And so. You know, they would just make sure that when we got out, we would be okay because mm-hmm. a lot of people would follow the cab, so they would know where where you're going. So you get out of the cab, and there were you know ten people there. Well, when ten people when people start asking people, what are you standing in front of the restaurant for? Then next thing you know, crowds start gathering. Anyway, this so is pre cell phone, so you had to call from your room, right? Uh, yeah, it was yeah. pre cell phone. Yeah. So different game. Yeah. So so. <laughs> Anyway, so we, we get there, and we're, we, he takes us to our seat, and we order, we order food, and um, we're sitting there, and there's you know, people all, all around, but there, nobody's right next to us, and we're just talking, and uh, you know, the, the guy comes, and he brings our food out, and, and I'm sitting over here, Mark's sitting there, and, and uh, for some reason, he didn't have silverware, okay, and, or he didn't have a steak knife, a fork and a steak knife, and and I don't know why, other than the fact that they probably were just, just enamored <laughs> with him that they forgot to do what they were supposed to do and bring the silverware out. So they bring our food out, and they bring our steaks down, and we're, I'm getting ready to eat, and Matt goes, oh, hey, I need a fork and a knife. And the guy reaches over, and he grabs mine, and he puts it from <laughs> <laughs> like, He's like, you yeah. need a knife too? Here you go. Yeah, I was like, I was like all right, do you think I can get one when you get a second? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. So he doesn't he just rip steaks apart? <laughs> oh god, that was funny. <laughs> That's awesome. I, there were some other, you know, little stuff like that, but I, I remember when we were in. Um, yeah, I guess I do remember some specific stuff. We were in. Uh, we had just gotten done. We were in Miami. Okay, so we had we, had, we were playing the Marlins, and this was late. This was in early September, and he had just hit. We went in for a three-game series, and he hit. Uh, I think he hit fifty. 56, 57, 58, and 59 in those three game series. So, so old Joe Robbie, did you play there? No. 
it was a big yard. Okay, that was where the Dolphins played. So oh, yeah. it was a big stadium, and and they weren't drawing anybody at that time. And so they they had these big uh, berg, uh, not uh, turquoise tarps mm-hmm. that would yeah. tarp the whole third level. Yeah. The whole three hundred level was tarp, and we go in there for batting practice, and and all the tarps were off from the f- from the foul part of the foul line all the way to center field and they sold those seats and, and we would go in for batting practice we go in for batting practice and there'd be 40,000 50,000 people for our BP they'd open the gates early so That's people awesome. could go in and he was launching balls up into that section not only in the game I think one or two of them went up there but his batting practice he was just living up there right <clears throat> so after the game well let me let me go back in the in the last the last game there he hit whatever it was I think it was 59 it might have been his second that game and it was late it was late it was like in the eighth it might have been the top of the eighth or top of the ninth it was one of those two and uh I wasn't playing this day so I was sitting on the bench and you know he comes in and you know it's you know whatever <laughs> another homer you know and uh and Tony comes up to me and he goes uh yeah, yeah, you know, Mark's foot's bothering. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take him. I'm gonna. You ever, you ever play any first base? I, I need you to go play first. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> and and there's, there's, fifty, sixty thousand people there that want to see Mark McGuire go to first and finish the game. Okay, they don't want to see me go to first. They they want him to come back out. And I I said, you're kidding. And he says, no, no, I, am, I you know got to get sack out of there his 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 foot and I I said all right so I go over to him and I you know I'm not going to tell you what I said to him but I said I need to borrow your glove so he gives me his glove and I go running out there to go to play the bottom of the ninth right and I I got about halfway out there and I got booed (laughs) till after the start of till after the first pitch so Tommy Sant do you know Tommy Sant Mm -mm. he's a Portland guy so so he was a he was a coach for the uh uh, he was with the Pirates for a while, and he was with the Marlins back then. He was their first base coach, and I'd known Tommy for years. So he comes running out, and he's like, "Dude, this is brutal." I said, <laughs> "I said that, you know, I, I I said what I said. I'm not gonna say what I said, but I was like, I can't believe he he did this. But I mean, I could believe, and I mean, you know, he he needed to get off his feet, I guess. But so I've never played first base in my life. Now, oh my you know, you, you know, you'd think, you know, it's first. You know, how tough can it be, right? But when you haven't done something, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm looking at the game from a totally different angle, right? I mean, the ball's, I'm not even in, I'm, I'm not even in there. I mean, I'm way away from any action, right? And, you know, you know, is the, when you're away from action, the ball gets on you a lot oh, faster yeah. than when you're, <laughs> you're right there, you, you think. You know, I just I was, wasn't, wasn't used to it. First guy, you know, I'm throwing the ball around, you know, in the infield and catching a ball in a glove that I, I, I don't even, I can't even feel it, right? And Tommy's just, <clears throat> he's just laughing. I said, he, I, he said, Lamp, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you, you know, with where to go. And I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Which here. position did he play? Oh, uh, I don't remember what Tommy did. Was he in the infield? I think he was an infielder. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> anyway, so he, yeah, but he was a coach. I mean, he knew, he knew what he was, what he was talking about. So first guy up, it's a ground ball to second. But it's, it's one of those to my right mm. where should I get it? Should I not get it? Yep. I, you know, but so my first move was to go get it because you know, I thought I maybe I'd get it. And then you're like, oh, I'm not going to get that. So hopefully, you know, he'll get it. And so I, you know, turn back to go to the bag. And now I've already taken four or five steps to my right. So I got to run back to the bag and turn my back to the runner. Okay. Which it seems pretty fundamental. Right. But at the time, you know, I, it, it wasn't for me. So I turn my back to the runner, get my, my legs. Are, I can't find the bag throws low. You know, I, it, it's in the dirt. I got to back up as it's thrown. I, the runner hits me. We freaking fall down. You know, it's been glisten. And they're booing again. And it was, it was brutal. I think the next two guys punched out, and I didn't have to worry about, you know, throwing the ball around. But it was, it was brutal. I, I went back in and threw the glove at him in his locker, and I said, don't ever do that to me again. I said, so that was, that was the. The, the first part of that, and then we get on the bus, and and I remember him calling his son, and he um, and I could hear him talking. So we had cell phones back then because he was on the phone with his son. Big brick phones. Yeah, I don't remember what what it was, but he was talking to him, and he said um, he said 
you know, I could hear his side of the conversation. It's like, hey, Matt, you know, and oh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, did you see the game today? And oh, well, you know, yeah, I hit a couple more home runs today. And, and, and he said, and then I could hear him say, oh, okay, well, okay, well, you know, call me when you get a chance. You know, and then he hung up. And I was sitting right in front of him on the bus. And he goes, dude, can you believe that? He goes, I, I just, I'm two home runs away from breaking this record. I just hit four <laughs> homers in the series, and my son's telling me he's got to go because he's spending the night at a friend's house. <laughs> he goes, well, maybe, he, goes yeah. how, how, he goes, how about that for perspective? And I, I just, yeah. I, I remember him saying that. And anyway, I just thought that was pretty cool. And there, there were, you know, obviously times, um, you know, as we got a little closer, and when he did break it, and then when he got to 70, and yeah, it was cool. It was a special year. I, it was a special year. Special, a lot of special things happened. You mentioned in Miami that was early September. He set the single season home run record on September eighth. Was when he hit his uh, sixty second home run. I saw the the video. You know, after he hits his sixty second, everyone's going crazy. They're all standing the entire game. You know, in anticipation. I see him hug you at, uh, after crossing home plate. Go to Sammy Sosa. What was that moment like? Um, and all yeah. That? So Sammy, I remember <clears throat> Sammy had. Um, he was in right field when he hit it, and he, as soon as he hit it, we all kind of jumped over the fence and uh, the gate, the fence there in front of the dugout, and we ran out. and And I remember Sammy came walking up, and and I I've known Sammy for years playing against him, and he came up to me and he said, um, he goes, hey, do you do you think do you think Mark would mind if I if I went up and congratulated him? And I said, no, man, not at all. He'd he'd love that. So Sammy went up to him and. You know, then, of course, you see the big exchange all over the, the TVs and the newspapers had that. And um, I, I, he, he, he was so gracious. Sammy's a good guy. I mean, what you saw on TV, the way he played the game, he was a lot like Junior. You know, he, he was just a fun loving. He loved baseball. He played it like a kid. And, you know, it really was a pretty it was really a pretty good guy to go through that with. I think if there could have been a, you know, a guy to choose, he would have been the guy, I think. Sammy Sosa ended with 66 home runs, and he would end up winning the MVP. Well, did you? Did everyone think that McGuire was going to be getting the MVP? I don't, you know, I don't remember. I think the Cubs won the division that year. Mm, okay. um, or if they didn't, they, they, they got into the playoffs. Maybe that had something to do with it. Yeah. I don't know. I know usually it does in those types of, of votings, but I don't recall um, there being a lot of discussion or – anything about uh about the mvp race i do remember too there was a time when we were um i think that was the first year interleague play i don't remember what what year interleague play was but it was right in that time 98 sounds right it was yeah. it was 97 or 98 I had, a, I had a pin from the astros playing the twins okay growing I, up and i can see almost 1998 written on it okay i'm almost sure it was right in that time anyway we we went in to play um to play Minnesota. We had a three game series against Minnesota and we had just come from, uh, I should say, I think Kansas City was was in Minnesota before we were, or um, Houston maybe. One of the smaller clubs was, was in Houston, or was in Minnesota playing before we were. And so we get there, it was like, a, I don't even remember what day, it was three game, but it was a three game series. And we get there and it's it's you know it's July so you know he's 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 got a lot of homers now right I mean it, it, everybody knows it's going to happen and it and the word is out that his batting practices are they're just circuses is what they are and so we we go in and they they, they announce um, that they're going to open the gates early everybody's opening gates early for our batting practice because people just they're just all going the outfield waiting for home run balls so uh, so after the it, it, I don't. Did you play in the Metrodome? Yeah. So they would. Um, I don't know if they did this then or if, if Mark started it. I don't know if they kept doing it, but they would put. If you hit a homer, they would put the um, the the distance on the on the big board up there. So you know, you know, whoever you know hit his so and so home run, it was 440 feet or whatever. So for our batting practice, there was you know, I mean, the, the place was full. I mean, especially the outfield. And his batting practice, every time he hit homer, they would put the distance up there. 
And, I mean, it's it's a joke. It's a, you know, it's just ridiculous. You look at a fence and it's three thirty, three forty, which is also a joke at that place because that was a, you know, everybody loved hitting there. A little short but, fence too. But now it's yeah, now it's real. I mean, it, you know, they're hundred feet. These numbers are a hundred, hundred and fifty feet further than what the fence is. So <clears throat> the next day, and the and the, the the headlines like Mark said, when you walk in the clubhouse, the newspapers are they're all spread out on the tables. Everybody would just some you know, not everybody. Some guys would grab and read them one. In the sports page, it had said that um, they had uh, the three-game attendance for the team that was there before us was not as many people as we had for our batting practice oh my on word. the first day. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you, this is what they made it. I mean, and they just pumped this up. So everywhere we went, everywhere we went, we sold out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the – the dugouts from the dugouts to the to the batting cage that you know the at home plate there they would rope off so we had a place to walk yeah. between the throngs of media it was like it was like a playoff game and i never played in a world series I, you know we, we played the yankees in the alcs and it was it was kind of like that but but it wasn't like this it yeah. wasn't like this and uh I mean, it was just, it was like that every, everywhere we went. But, but I do remember in Minnesota, they put that out there, and I thought that was kind of funny. But another memory, I guess. That was a cool part. Yeah. It was fun. BP was a lot of fun. Yeah. You could run forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> out there shagging. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could rob homers in left field all day long. Yeah. <laughs> a little short fence about this high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess looking back, I'm curious on both of you guys' opinions. Do you think the 1998 home run race or that era had a lasting impact on how baseball started to change or has changed since? Well, or talk about some differences between, you know, when you were I playing think, versus... I think you. the game was moving in that direction. I think, I mean, when was the strike? What year was that? 94. 94. I, I, that year, I remember so many guys just hitting bomb after bomb after bomb. Like, they were on pace to break the record. And then the season got cut That's short. Right, yeah. I mean, I know – I remember Jeff Bagwell specifically, mm -hmm. like, being on pace to just destroy it. And then it got, you know, put down, um, obviously for good reasons. Um, but I think that that kind of started everything. And then that was like – that. this is now a possibility after almost 60 years – you know, that this record could finally be broken. We're in that era of baseball. And I don't know, I think from there it just took off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I remember, I, I remember there being a lot of home runs those, you know, those handful of years. But then I, you know, after my last year was 02, and then I, I, I didn't really follow it much until just the last few years. You, you notice a lot of guys starting to hit more homers now, so. I don't. I don't really know. I, I remember that, um, <clears throat> you know, the whole steroid controversy came out after that. So uh, there were a lot of people that were um, that I think uh, uh, wanted to kind of squash the whole notion that it was a big, you know, home run. That home runs were real, you know, prominent because you know they thought people were, you know, were doing it unfairly. So I don't. I don't know if uh, what that had to do with what's going on today. I, I don't. I don't know. I just remember that uh, there was a lot of guys hitting homers those years, and but those were good hitters, man. I mean, I know I know that they change 100. percent They change the balls yeah, from the year balls to year. Were yeah, I remember specifically in 2016, going from 2015 to 2016, balls were flying. Something was done different. Balls were going out, you know, off the lower part of the barrel. Well, they were talking. They talked about that. They talked. I think they talked about doing that in the '90s too, the late '90s. They yeah. changed the ball. They might have changed it for the better, and I mean, yeah, for and the I'll, longer in, in, in the '90s. But I do remember hearing something about that. And also in the in the recent years, we've heard about the juice balls, to oh, where just, they would send the juice balls to the primetime games, yep. like the the Yankees, the Dodgers, all those I'll series that, that are Sunday night baseball, to where these balls are flying compared to everywhere else. That's right. So. There's Same thing in the home run derby. When you watch a home run derby at Yankee Stadium, the one where uh, Josh Hamilton was just going off yeah. years ago, I mean, those balls are f like 500 feet. You're not hitting a baseball 500 feet. Yeah, and that's not only a long that, way. But when you when you when you hit one, you you most of the time you know it's gone. I mean, even 
guy like me, I wasn't a home run hitter, but when you hit one good, you, you know you got it. And when I don't hit one good, I mean, I, I know I don't yeah. have it, but yeah. you play at a place like, you know, Colorado where, yeah. you know, you hit a pop up and you're like, oh, that might have a chance, you know, even though I didn't hit it, you know, yeah. same thing with the, with the baseball. You know, if you, if you don't, if you hit, don't hit a baseball good and it goes out, you, you're thinking to yourself, either there's a lot of wind up there or, you know, something's in the ball because there's no That's way right. that ball should have gone out. And from a pitcher's perspective, you can hear it. Like, I can't feel it, obviously, because you guys are the ones swinging the bat. But you know if a guy got it, the way that yeah, it yeah. sounds. And it has, yeah. like, a little different crack to it mm -hmm. if it hits a little under the barrel. They hit it well, but you know they didn't get it. And yeah. those balls were starting to go out in 2016. Do, yeah. you, do you, you don't notice a difference as a pitcher with the weight of the ball, no, do you? No, I think the, the weight's the, the same. It's I think it's a different way they, they wind it. There's different stuff in the ball, maybe. Maybe they wind it tighter. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't either. But, uh, but, but they're, they're definitely... I mean, there's definitely something they could do to it, and we wouldn't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and unless you watch it. You'd have to send it into a lab and have them analyze, you know, from year to year. Yeah. This is what we've got. Yeah. It's beyond my reach. And then, I guess, however much you want to talk about it, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the controversies back then, however much you want to talk about, you know, what, what McGuire had to deal with after the fact in Sammy Sosa and just that era with what was coming out. I mean, yeah, so we talked about this a little bit, I think, yeah. after the, the, the show. Um, and I don't know how Mark feels about this, and, and I, uh, I might be, you know, um, on my own island with this. But the way I look at this is, <clears throat> you know, uh, these guys, first of all, these guys, you, you got to hit it, right? I mean, I don't care how big or strong you are or what you're taking. I mean, hitting a baseball is hard, okay? It, it, and, and, and to hit it on the part of the bat where it has to, you know, where it goes over the fence and, and the situations that you got to hit in is even, it just adds to it. Um, so you can't take that away from anybody. Um, and then all the accusations about, you know, the steroids and the, you know, that type of stuff, the PEDs and those things, you know, as far as I, I remember and, and my memory's fading, but I don't remember that being illegal at the time. So, if you're doing something illegal, then I believe you should you should have to you know be responsible for whatever consequences go with that. But if you're just if you're just trying to get a competitive advantage, I don't first of all don't have an issue with that. You know, on the flip side of that, I believe that that every you know everything you do has a a consequence or or, or it's a risk reward thing, right? Is it, is what I'm doing worth you know uh, the reward of what follows it and what happens from it and for the people that decided to do those types of things, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. That's, that's not up to me to decide. I know from personally, I didn't do them because the reward wasn't going to be worth the risk that the potential risk, not mm -hmm. even the risk, the potential risk and the potential reward for me wasn't worth it. I've always been conservative in everything I've done. I mean, from investment investments to, you know, to, decisions that I make are, are usually very conservative. So that's just not me. Um, but, uh, you know, take it a step further. And, and this is what, what we talked about is, is these, this whole issue of performance enhancing drug, in, in, in my opinion, I don't know how steroids were a performance enhancing drug in, in baseball. I mean, it may be in bodybuilding. I could see how, how that might be, but, um, you know, if, if people, if the if people had career-ending injuries because they were taking steroids that that where they end, their bodies end up growing faster than than they could handle it and then they they got hurt playing baseball, I don't know how that's a performance-enhancing drug. In, in my opinion, it, it it's the opposite of that, right? So, I mean, you're not guaranteed to hit 70 homers or to throw 100 miles an hour or to win 20 games and or to run, you know, a uh, whatever, a 3-8 to first, you, you're not guaranteed to do any of that with, with steroids. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a product that you take to help muscle growth and help, <clears throat> you know, help your body rebound from breaking it down, whether it's from lifting or rehabbing or whatever. But, you know, you hear of all the injuries that have happened to people that have been on that, you know. So I, I guess, first of all, I just don't know how that can be considered performance enhancing. I, I think it's the opposite. Um, and then, you know, to... You know, to keep a guy out like, like Bonds or 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 McGuire or Clemens, Clemens. I mean, yeah. 
how do you keep people out of the Hall of Fame? Because right. they did something that they thought might, and I don't even know if they did, right? But that were accused or said that they took something to try to help their careers. How, how, how is that, how does that, how, how, how can you keep somebody out of the Hall of Fame? I just don't understand that. You could, yeah. I mean, they, these, these guys, if, if it does what people have claimed that it can do, which is ruin a career, how, 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 can, how can you say that, that you know, they, they wouldn't have done what they did if they didn't take those or participate in that? You can't do that. I mean, who knows? McGuire might have had 80 or 90 homers if the guys that got hurt wouldn't have been taking steroids. So, I mean, he could have had, you know, 90 that year or, or, or however many wins Clemens could have had. I, I don't know. I, I just I think it's ridiculous to do that and to think that. But that's just my own take on it. You know, these guys, uh, I, I faced Roger Clemens in 1988. It was my... I think I faced him in my second major league at bat. It was in Cleveland. And um, so I, I think he was drafted in the mid to early 80s. I want to say 84, maybe 83. But he was, <clears throat> he was unbelievable. He, he was unbelievable. And, and then I faced him again in 01 when I was in Seattle. I think it was 01. It was either 2000 or 2001. So, I mean, I watched him learn how to pitch. I mean, he went from a, a thrower mm. uh, to a guy that could had great command. He still threw hard, but he had great command. He, he learned how to throw a split finger, and he, I mean, he was his dominant pitcher. And then I saw Bonds. I played against Bonds when he came up with Pittsburgh in Instruction League in 86. 86. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah, he was smaller. I was smaller. <laughs> you know, I mean, we all, you know, work out and put weight on as we get a little bit older. I mean, was some of it steroids? I don't know. But I can tell you he got bigger and stronger. But he was always a great player. He was a great player in 86 when I saw him. You know, and, and McGuire, same thing. I mean, these, he had 49 homers his rookie year. I mean, I, I, I just don't – I don't – I just don't – I think that what these guys did speaks for itself. And I don't know. I might be alone in that, but that's, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, I can – I feel like he just spoke for me. <laughs> I mean, I don't have – I wasn't in that era of baseball, so it's different. It's hard to, like, put myself in there. How I how would have I responded? I don't know. I wasn't in that situation. I have no clue. Um, but like you said, it wasn't against the rules. Um, for me, the closest thing I can compare it to is as a pitcher, you know, my first day in the league, I'm, I'm throwing a ball during batting practice full of pine tar just so that pine tar is still in my hands when I go in to pitch that night. Mm -hmm. Just to have a grip on the, on the ball, but not it's not helping me. I still have to throw the pitch. I still have to locate it. I still have to execute. More than anything, it was for the safety of the player that's in the right-handed batter's <laughs> box right. because they, they rub those balls up with this mud that is chalky, and it just slips right out of your hand. And, that, and it's different on a day game. It's different on a night game. It's different from place to place because a different person's rubbing up the ball. Um, but that was consistent if I could make sure that I had something to give me a little bit of room for air. Um, but that, at the time, wasn't against the rules like it was now. Right. And I, if they came out to check my hands, they wouldn't even have known that there was anything on there. It was just a little bit of something. So, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, the stuff that Mark McGuire was taking at the time, I believe, was you know within the rules, and then it came out after that it might be performance enhancing and it's the same argument as the rosin as the sunscreen com combination with rosin that's yeah. been in the league recently to where you know pitchers put sunscreen on their arms and then they toss the rosin bag around oh, yeah. and they Sticky go back as it gets, man. go back to it and now they have to check between each half inning and, and you know you got guys like Max Scherzer who's kind of older in the league and he's dropping his trousers when the ump comes out cuz he's just done with it mm -hmm. so it's like where do you draw the line with these types of things and yeah, it's like for the safety of the hitter, let alone the pitcher being able to have an advantage, it's so that they also don't get hit with the 100-mile-an-hour right. fastball. Yeah, you know, I remember – I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I remember <laughs> when I first got called up to San Diego in 90. I got traded in 1990. So we had some old pitchers on that team, guys that have been around for 10, 15 years. I mean, that was back when pitchers – well, players in general stayed. You know, if you, if you could stay in the big leagues, you stayed in the big leagues, right? I mean, you were there for long. The guys had longer careers. And when I got to back there catching him, mean, I, I got traded. I got traded when Santiago broke his arm. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. Jeff Brantley hit, mm -hmm. hit Benito with a pitch and broke his arm. I got traded from 
Cleveland to, I was in AAA Cleveland at the time, Colorado Springs. I get traded to San Diego. I fly to Pittsburgh to meet the team, and I got to catch, you know, Ed Whitson and, and, and Craig Lefferts and, you know, Calvin Schiraldi and Bruce Hurst. And, I mean, gosh, some, you know, I mean, great, great players. Had 10, 15 years of major league experience. Eric Schau. I mean, they're just a bunch of guys. Anyway, uh, it, I, I'm going over the signs with this guy, and he's like, okay, you know, one's fastball, two's curveball and stuff. And he goes, okay, if I grab my hat and pull my hat down with two fingers, then that's the spitball. <laughs> I'm loading that one up, okay? If it's just one, then it's nothing, you know? So I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I mean, you know, if you, if you played it, you know, you spend a lot of time playing, you know, you know where to hold the scuff, right, to make the ball move. And I know as a catcher, you know, I know if a guy's going to make, if a guy's going to load the ball up or if he's got a scuff on the ball, I got to know what it is because I'm not going to catch it if, if, if it doesn't, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to move a lot more than it should. So I, I just need to know those things, right? So he's like, okay, you know, if he does that, and I throw the ball back to him and he grab his hat, you know, and I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to get that on this pitch. And, you know, but the, but the hitter was in danger there and they didn't have the, the stuff all over him, you know, like they have now. But, you know, and okay, you don't throw as hard. Okay, I, I get that. But, you know, if you get hit in, on a bone, it's going to hurt whether a guy's throwing 80 or 100. It right. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, you get hit in the meat, uh, go to first. It's not a big deal. It, it, I mean, it's going to bruise, but yeah. it's not going to take you out of the game. But anyway, if, if I don't know, more importantly, if I don't know what the ball's going to do, I got no shot of catching it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if somebody's on, that's a problem. Mm. So, he would he would have signs and 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 I'm telling you there's pitchers on almost every team that I played with that had a, some type of sign if the ball was cut if the mm -hmm. ball was scuffed if if the ball if they could load the ball up this is what they do and this was the sign for it yep. gotcha mine was a shake of the self when I would get signs it would be I wouldn't even say yes or no like if I didn't want the pitch I just stare I just keep staring I would never shake my head at yeah. so the catcher's like okay I'll throw more signs I just stare. I, when it was one with a scuff on it, I would give him a, I would shake my head yes. So when I got the pitch I wanted, I would just come set. But they knew when it had a scuff on it because I'd kind of shake my head, yeah, that's what I want. And it had a little more action to it. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, and then you'd was, have catchers yeah, yeah. that would take the ball and you know you have those clips on your shin guards and they would go back to throw it and they'd scuff it on their shin guard. they hit their shin guard on the way back and throw it to you. Mm. And you get the ball back and you're like, all right, thanks, dude. Yeah, <laughs> middle infielders would do it. I mean... That's why. That's why when balls hit the ground, they're immediately thrown out. Because oh, okay. we we get. I sometimes I'd get balls. I'd get a ball, and if I noticed that there was scuff, scuff on it, I'd run it out to the pitcher and I'd say, "Hey, this ball's got a scuff on it," or I'd throw it back to him. And there was a couple guys that we had really good relationships with that I would have a sign saying, the "Ball's got a scuff on it," so that I would I could tell him that just in case he wouldn't look at it. Most guys did, but at least he would know. Mm -hmm. And then we're just throwing sinkers all day long. Yeah. You know, two sinkers all day long. Yeah. When you get a pitch like a ball like that, but which, which I guess leads me to another point, which is the whole sign stealing thing, mm. which in my opinion is a joke. You know, you don't you don't you don't like it, change your signs. That's right. You don't like it, disguise your signs. Yeah. What do you think about the 2017 to where they had a video camera, a guy in the dugout down the hall to That's where illegal. he was watching I mean, that, that pounding a happen. trash can? So is there a line to that? So, like I said before, in my opinion. If somebody is going to do something that breaks the rules of the game, the written rules of the game, not the assumed rules of the game or the etiquette, but the written rules, then they should be punished for mm -hmm. that because that's, that's, that's why they're written, right? But if somebody's just trying to relay signs, everybody right. does that. That's right. Everybody yeah. beats on garbage cans. Everybody yells you. numbers. Everybody's hands on, hands off. Everybody first name, last name, nickname, number. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to relay signs in. Everybody uses the cameras. I mean, I can sit there. We, we guys run in the dugout and watch the catcher use, you know. Well, first of all, is this a fastball? Most time it is. Is that a breaking ball? Most time it is. Is that a changeup? Yeah, most time it is. Well, once we know that, then you start trying to pick up patterns. You start mm -hmm. to pick up maybe the pitcher's tipping it. Now, you don't do it much in the big leagues, but, you know, sometimes a catcher will give them away. You, that you got to pay attention to that. I mean, that's gaining a competitive advantage. You're not doing anything wrong. You might be doing, you might not be doing what everybody would do, but everybody steals signs and, and that. everybody tries to look for stuff like that. And then everybody tries to relay them into the, to the, you know, to the guy hitting or the, to, to the pitcher. I mean, it's always been part of the game. Everybody does it. Even if you know a pitch is coming, you still have to be able to hit that. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. You still have to be able to hit it. But, but as a, as a catcher, 
I, I, I listen for that. I mean, I, I'm putting a, you know, a, a two down and I'm, I'm watching, I'm listening. I'm, cause I, I know as a hitter, guys would yell it at me. So if they're, they can do that, then they can sure yell it at the guy that's hitting, right? I got to be able to hear that or pay attention to it. And I'm going to go out and change the sign. A lot of times I would throw the ball back to the pitcher. I had signs, especially like with, with, so you got your pitchers that are throwers, right? And then you got your pitchers that are pitchers, you know, they're, they're smart. They're, they're guys that are smart. And then there are guys that just, they just got a good arm and, you know, so whatever you call yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So there were guys I remember like, and I always use Jamie as an example because he was a pitcher. Jamie was a smart pitcher and he was a, he, he, he was aware of what was going on. If you ever get him, he'd be a good guy to get. I heard he's to. local. Yeah, he is in Washougal. How do you make that happen? He's he's he is a he's a good guy to get, in, in, and he'll talk. Pick yeah. a brain. He'll start talking, and he'll he'll he's he's got all kinds of information. But I mean, I'd change signs from pitch to pitch, throwing the ball back to him. I'd throw the ball back to him and change the sign. You know, I'd throw the ball back to him. And if I grab my anything on my my mask, it was first sign. Throw it back. Adjust my chest protector. Anything from here to here was second sign, and anything from there down was third sign. So I'd throw the ball back to him, and I'd turn around and adjust my shin guard and look back, and he would touch his hat, and I knew he had it. Wow. So that we could change the signs from pitch to pitch. Mm -hmm. So I could give a I could give one sign with a guy on second. Okay, watch what he did. If he relayed the sign to the hitter, then I would just change the sign to second sign, and I would give you know three signs or whatever and. Well, the hitter doesn't take a cock shot, right? Because he's not sitting on it. Yep. He's like, well, and then, 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 then the, the guy on second then gives the sign back to the hitter. I don't have them anymore. And then you're good, right? So this is, we know this. Everybody does it. You just got to pay attention to it. It's mm -hmm. the people that don't pay attention to it, the ones that get, mm -hmm. the ones that get bit by it. Now, it, like I said, if you do something that's wrong against the rules, okay, I get that. But if you just do something that, uh, that you're trying to do to get to gain a competitive advantage and, and that's not against the rules I got no problem with it that's that's on the that's on the catcher and the pitcher to figure something out in my opinion yeah and that's that's why that you're able to change the pitch so or the change the the sign and all those things that you're able to and each player has to be paying so much attention to all those small details to be able to pick that up yeah and then I, I'm curious like even if you know the, the hitter you know standing in the in the box they're trying to hit this guy that's probably got nasty stuff. So they're trying to focus on that. And then they're also having to draw their attention away to figure out what the guy on second is saying or someone in their dugout. I mean, does that make it harder? Yeah, even? so there, there's a lot of guys that, um, there's a lot of guys that don't want the signs. Okay, there's, in fact, we would go into our hitters meetings and the, somebody says, okay, we, we, we usually know what their signs are or we can get their signs. Does anybody not want them? And then guys will say that they don't want them. Okay. Okay. So there are guys that just they didn't they didn't they didn't want for one reason or another whether the guy whoever was a relay might get them wrong or whatever guys some guys just didn't want the signs. But we had a sign with the guy on second where he would relay into the hitter, hey, I have the signs. Do you want them? And then the hitter would then respond back either by touching the plate or not touching the plate. If he touches the plate, he wants them. If he doesn't touch the plate, he doesn't want them. But they hit the guy on second would, you know, whatever the pre-assigned sign was, grab your belt. Hey, I got them. Do you want them? You know, so, I mean, everybody, everybody, everybody did it, you know? And it was just a matter of, can I, am I aware enough to, to pick up when they got them and when they don't? Now, if, I, if, if I'm set up down and away and, and the guy throws a nasty pitch and the guy juices me to right center, I, either they got him or he, he just tipped his pitch mm -hmm. or Piazza hit it because he killed that pitch. But, <laughs> but other than that, you know, I mean, you got to pay attention to the game too. I mean, if you throw a nasty breaking ball with two strikes and you got to set up for a breaking ball and you don't swing at it, I got to start thinking maybe he's got the signs, you know, because yeah. he should have swung at that. Mm -hmm. You know, Adrian Beltre doesn't chase a slider down and away with two strikes. He's, he's not, he's sitting on, That's he's right. sitting on something else, That's you know, right. You're, he, that, so there's, there's some, there's sometimes you, you got to, you got to take responsibility for guys knowing what's coming. I mean, you know, it was, it's part of the game. I mean, part, it's yeah. part of baseball and it's just not even existent yeah. in existence anymore. And yeah. it's, I don't know, it's kind of, it's old school baseball. That's you making know, me, yeah. It's a lot of old school parts of baseball that are disappearing and it's just, it's tough to see because that was the part where you had to think 
you had to you had to think you had to use your brain you had to play more of a chess match with the hitter at the plate maybe with the whole dugout so that they're not picking up on your stuff i mean new york was notorious for that we'd go into new york and change all of our signs because they knew what your signs were coming in if they were consistent and we'd have two sets of signs where the catcher would come out mid at bat with the guy in second jeter's at second base touch his helmet and then you touch your hat saying all right we're going to second sec, second signs right here and we just went with it yeah. but you had to yeah. you know but that was the game it's like if you know that going mm -hmm. in if you know that that's a possibility then you better have a backup plan and you better have something under your sleeve to counter yeah. counteract that yeah and i don't want the major league baseball to come in and make a rule that you can't do this or you can't do that i mean now the game you know they, that you don't want to micromanage the game. You know, give us the rules of the game. Let us play the game, and let it be fall on our. It's our responsibility to figure out if somebody's relaying signs, and it's our responsibility to do something about it if they That's are. That's exactly right. And that was the other thing, is back in the day you could do something about it, and it's like, hey, we got them. Do we really want to use these right now? <laughs> because we're going to get one in the ear hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Was a way to keep everybody honest. I mean, it was that was baseball. You're so being a conservative, I'd imagine that you believe in less regulation, less less rules might help the game instead of, you know, them stepping in and saying, hey, we're going to do this to try to change things. Um, I'm curious if the whole pitch clock has mm -hmm. to do, you know, kind of with the sign stealing thing to where they're saying, hey, we want to speed up the game so that more people watch baseball. But I guess as a side thing, it might be affecting the amount of time that players have to be able to relay signs to do these different things. I'm trying to figure out where it fell off where nobody was watching baseball because right. I haven't seen that. Yeah. The, peop the people that were into baseball, <clears throat> they're always going to be into baseball, but who is watching the game now that wasn't watching it before? Yeah. But, did, I don't you, know. did you play – so you played in both of those. I did the pitch clock through the minor leagues um, so when they were trying to figure out if it was functional. So did you pitch in the big leagues without it? Yeah. So you did without it and with it? Mm-hmm. What years uh, did they have it in the minor leagues when you were pitching? Um, I was with Tacoma in 2015. So they were doing it even back then? And then 2017 for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, they were just trying it out, and it was 20 or 25 seconds. But even with that, like, I never got down and ever had, you know, a ball added to the count because um, you could just step off. Right. You know, there wasn't a max amount of step-offs. If you looked oh, up, it was like okay. at three seconds, you know, you step off. Now there's Get a back on. two disengagements. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so it was never an issue. But then again, I never got down to Like, that's a long time. 20 seconds is a long time. Right. Um, and I felt like I was pretty slow. But maybe I wasn't. <laughs> I, don't, I have no idea. Did you find that yourself as a pitcher had an advantage with the pitch clock? Because you're able to mess with the hitter's So timing? there was, um, I forget what team I was with. There was some kind of something to do with the way your brain registers the previous pitch. If you could wait 20 seconds in order to mess up that timing from the last thing that they saw, I would do that on purpose. So I would get there, get my signs, no, 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 no. I would step off. I would get back on and engage. And the first sign he put down was the first one I just shook off the previous set. And just to buy me, I don't know, 30, 35 seconds, just to give me an advantage if it was a yeah. big pitch. I mean, right. I wouldn't do it all the time, but if it was a big pitch with a guy on second and it's the tying run and he's in a favorable count, like I wanted to do whatever I could do to get that guy out. Um, but that's what I was just saying. Those are the, the parts of the game where you had to think, you try to, had to, I don't know, move a piece a different way on a chessboard, you know, to give yourself a little bit of an advantage later on. Um, and that was the part of baseball that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, just competing with your peers. Like game is manship. That's right. Yeah. I don't know what I missed about the pitch count thing, but you know, I didn't have to play with it. You know, and um, you know, probably guess that I have an opinion on that too, which I do. I don't personally. You, you, you pay what fifty dollars to park now, eighty dollars to park yeah, in some of these places. Insane, yeah. yeah. Game's over in two you, you, hours. You, right. Yeah, you know, you got you got beers to drink, right? You got ten dollar or twenty dollar beers. You got, you know, however much your hot dog is, and you got a day out with your kid. Why would you want it, that to be an hour and twenty minutes? Agreed. Instead, you get three hours. Right. Right. Agreed. I mean, you go to the ballpark to 
spend time with everybody. Right? You mean, miss so much being at the game, watching the game, because you're right. trying to look at a screen to see like where a pitch was. If yeah. you're at the side angle, you're not seeing that. If you're at the game, it's more for yeah. more so for the experience That's and right. with the people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I went to a concert last night, and it was three hours and fifteen minutes. I, I, can you imagine if it would have been like an hour? I'd be like, this yeah. is, you know, yeah. that isn't worth it. Yeah. These guys are, you know, they're up there giving us a show. I mean, now granted, you know, we we want to. You know, we're trying to play the game. We're not trying to, you know, intentionally drag it out. And if I'm catching, I want my pitcher to work fast mm -hmm. most of the time, right? You put a pitch count on Nolan Ryan. Did you see what? Did you ever watch him play? Oh, he yeah. took two minutes between each pitch. <laughs> I, I remember we went in there when I played for Milwaukee in. Uh, it would have been '93 uh, because it was the only year I was in Milwaukee. We go into Texas in Arlington, old Arlington, to play the Rangers, and Ryan is coming back from a rehab. I believe it's his last year. I think 93 was his last year. And I got to face him. One of the coolest experiences of my life. And, I mean, you talk about watching kids growing up, okay? He was the guy, mm -hmm. right? And you know, uh, yeah. Houston too, especially. Yeah. So he's, we go to Arlington, and I'm playing for Milwaukee, and for some reason I can't explain, I'm in the freaking six hole today, okay? So hitting a buck, whatever, 89 or 90 or whatever it was, or 200 at the time. So we go in there. I, I'm, I'm going to face Nolan Ryan hitting sixth. He's on a rehab. Place is packed. He's throwing 97, whatever. Nolan Ryan, okay, I, I know I'm going to get a heater, at least one, right, every at bat. And I remember standing on deck. I remember before, actually, I was standing on deck. I was standing in the dugout. We were in the third base dugout, and I'm watching him pitch. And now I'm 20, I don't remember, I don't even know how old I was then, 27, 28. And, and I'm, I mean, I, I am so anxious. I don't think I've ever been as anxious in my life for anything than I was for that at bat against, against him that day. ESPN, Sunday night game of the week. And he is taking forever on the mound, and, and, which is adding to my Your anxiety. Your stomach is just turning right? over. And I'm going, you know, this is, this is everything against, as a catcher, what I try to get pitchers to do, right? I mean, get them in a rhythm. The less you can think about things, the better, for the most part. You know, you throw a couple balls, you go 2-0. and oh, Okay, I get it. Take your walk. Come back on the mound. Let's get in a rhythm. You know, start to establish some type of rhythm. That, In my opinion, pitchers have always pitched better that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel yeah. about that. No doubt. Most guys don't try to take that much time between pitches. But if you go 2-0, and oh, I'm not going to yeah. force my guy to get on the mound in 14 pitches and throw. Hey, then you might as well go 3-0. and oh. Now you're going to really extend the game because you just walked a guy when he could have thrown a strike, maybe gotten out of the inning or whatever, but now you're going to put a guy and he's going to throw two extra pitches because he couldn't step out and gather himself. Okay, that, that's my, my take on that. Anyway, Ryan didn't – he didn't he – wasn't, he wasn't playing that game that day. I don't know if he always pitched like that or if he was always slow, but he was methodical. He'd throw the pitch, he'd walk around the mound, he'd do all of this stuff. And I'm like, I can remember just – getting you know let's go we don't get on the mound you'll throw the ball and it, maybe it was a way to fire myself up or whatever for that but I can I can imagine what he would have said in that situation oh yeah to a pitch clock in fact I bet they probably wouldn't even have implemented it they probably would have said you know what I don't know if we can do this but Brian's <laughs> still pitching right now because yeah. he uh, he don't he don't play that he didn't play that way yeah but you know, for me, I, I think, you know, guys are conscious of trying to do things in a manner where um, it's efficient for them, you know. And I think pitching, getting in a rhythm when you're pitching is efficient. If a guy needs to step out of the box for, you know, what's three extra seconds times, you know, 40 at-bats in a game? Uh, what, an extra hour with your kid? Right. Where's, the, where's the problem with that? Yeah. You know? I, did ratings go down that much? That's what and I was saying. And did they improve that much? I don't know. That maybe, you know, maybe yeah. it did. But I guarantee that reduced ratings aren't directly related to the time of the game. It's got more to do with the product you're putting on the field. Right. There weren't reduced ratings when I was in 98 when we were going into every stadium and filling out. There weren't reduced ratings on television around the world when McGuire was hitting those homers. And there was no pitch count. There was mm -hmm. no pitch what time whatever the hell they call it there was none of that going on that so maybe we should look at the product that we're putting on the field maybe we should look at the quality or the whatever the people that are coming up through the minor leagues 
for what those of, players were doing to make that game fun to watch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you know that. The, yeah, that, I don't know. I don't know. Things have changed, and we went through this last time. I don't. Know, people probably watch that. And like, oh, he, he doesn't know what's going on nowadays. Yeah, man, no, I have a question that we'll talk about in a second that we briefly talked on last time. But first, I want to say. I mean, you know, MLB is trying to get more people to watch the game, but then they have blackout restrictions on TV mm -hmm. and they're not allowing fans to watch all of the games. They're making it harder on fans to get access or they're making you pay for a higher subscription to be mm -hmm. able to do something. Like uh, I, I did a live stream last night when Jared Kelling was traded and someone was saying that the flex membership packages at the Mariner games from 2022 to this year, they've gone up 66%. No, I don't doubt it. The, the cost of to, to go to a game, the parking, the, the the food, the drink, all that stuff is going up. It's like you're making it harder. And then just get rid of the blackout restrictions. If you actually want to grow the game, you can do that. You don't have to do it in the ways to where you're just getting what you want. That's right. That's so. right. No, I agree. And they're, My parents go through it for Astro games at home all the time. Um, we don't get it here. Root Sports is always really good about yeah. it. Um, I just but, get a VPN. But in Houston, I mean, they don't, they can't watch any of the games. Their own teams they like to watch can't even tune in. And if you're in a big city. It's unacceptable city, in 2023. If you're in a big city like Los Angeles, or, you know, even when I was on a trip in Hawaii, there's tons of markets that are blacked out. Yep. It's like, what's going on here? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a whole money aspect of this that, that I don't understand. We, we'll, we'll never understand, the, you know, all the ins and outs of, you know, the TV packages and stuff like that. But. You know, from a player's perspective, you know, I, I, there are things that we can do, I think, as players to make the game more attractive to people. Um, like you mentioned earlier, signing autographs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a small thing that we can, we can notch out. And I used to notch out a time in my day when I would go out there, and it was typically after my batting practice. I would spend my time after my BP, after my round was over, that's when I would do it, you know. And, or I would try to leave the clubhouse maybe earlier, like when we were in Milwaukee, we had to walk through the crowd to get to our cars. And I mean, it was, there was times that it was a pain, but there were other times that I'd, you know, you just bite the bullet and say, honey, I'm gonna be a half hour today and I'm gonna sit there and that's what I'm gonna do. So I think there's some things that we can do to make it more fan friendly, um, where it really doesn't, we don't have to bring in a governing body to put restrictions on us. Um, and, and maybe that's something that, that they do now more nowadays, I don't know. But I think those are types of things that we can do. We can do things in spring training. Spring training is a great time to try to bring the fans into it more. Mm -hmm. Do packages. Get get make the make the, the players are accessible in spring training. Yeah. Right. You know, that's that's where you really can start sparking up a lot of the interest for people is get them down to spring training. I know, like, uh, you know, the Giants, the the Yankees, the, the Cubs, uh, Cardinals are good at doing that. You know, they bring all their their Hall of Famers in. You know, I mean. You, you go to a giant spring training. I took my, my son my son in law to a giant spring training. We go in the clubhouse and you know Willie Mays is sitting in there and he gets his picture taken with Willie Mays and, and you know, Musual when he was alive and Marischal and, and I mean these guys bring all these people down for spring training to try to strike up interest and clubs could do that. The smaller market clubs didn't with, with traditions not quite as rich, they didn't do that as much. And maybe they don't want to spend the money to bring those guys in, but bring those guys in. Mm -hmm. That's what fans come to see that they want that experience. And those are the types of people that go to the games in Seattle, you know, and, and I think those are, that, I think that's a big, they, they could really use spring training, I think more. And maybe they do now. They, I haven't been a spring training in 20 years, but maybe they do that more now, but they could have done that <coughs> better back then. And guys are receptive. I think more receptive in spring training, especially early in spring training when the, the sure. games don't matter as much, Yep. you know? So, that's my, oh, that's the way I see it at least. Because I, it would be nice to get fans more involved if if you really want viewership, bring people to the ballparks. People are willing to pay a higher price if their experience is better, mm -hmm. right? Like they do in Seattle. Um, there's a season ticket <laughs> membership day to where they uh, block off the warning tracks, mm -hmm. and then the players walk around the outside, and like there's all the season ticket holders that have access on the field, they're getting pictures, taking selfies, all that stuff. So I see them doing that type of stuff to where they are trying to bring the fans closer to the game. And that's kind of what my goal is with this, is to be able to get access to some of these players and be able to show their personality and who they are on and off the field and why these fans should be yeah. a fan of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what was your experience with, you were a little later on, 
did you see that fans had decent access with spring training or at yeah games? i mean here and there here and there it's um i agree with you there could be more that could be done um on the, at the same time you know i really put myself out there as much as i could anytime somebody asked me i said yes um, you because, did because i felt like that was my duty but 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 not ever, not no, all the guys not do ever, that. no they don't they don't especially in today's game because it's it's more focused on you as a person and what how does this mess up my day you know but for me when i was playing it was what an honor what a privilege mm -hmm. to be in so, this situation so a guy like but you and you said earlier you know you you learn from guys ahead of you yes. right and, and you you have to do that yes i mean these guys ahead of us you know they, they, there's so much that you can learn from these guys and it's not tough to carve out a little time in your day make That's it a right. part of your routine to carve out a part of your day for that and the guys need to realize today and when i was playing that that's they're the guys that pay your salary i mean putting people in the ballpark that's 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 why baseball still is is baseball yeah. that needs to be a part of your routine at some point mm -hmm. and in spring training not that it's not done but i don't think it's done as much as it could be because that's the time especially early on when there's not a lot of pressure going on, guys are still, they're in a good mood because they're down, you know, they're getting back together with the guys. Good time to start bringing people in. That mm -hmm. is the time to do it. Not during the season, right. 15 minutes before the <clears throat> game starts and you're over for your last 20. You don't want to go out and walk around the warning track and say hi to the boosters, right? I mean, that's yeah. a, not the time for that, you know. But fan interaction with the players, spring trainings, and then I would say to the to the guys that are playing the game now that make that a part of your your time. Yeah. Not only will the fans reward you when you don't do stuff as well as you want to do all the time, but but they that that needs to happen. That yeah. needs to happen because you don't know who those kids are out there that yeah. are going to one day become big leaguer or you know who knows how how you can affect these people's lives. But that that in itself is is a lot bigger than the game and more reaches than one. So that needs to be done if it's not being done yeah. already. A couple of things I've seen during spring training are mic'd up players, which yeah. is awesome yeah, that's cool. on TV during a game, you know, a left fielder talking to the batter mm -hmm. or the pitcher talking to the batter. Um, also there's, there are some fan, you know, questions. Someone's getting interviewed on the sideline. There will be a fan question, you know, they're on the phone or they're asking the question directly to the player. So there are some things that are, that are cool. Um, I do want to see more of that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of a uh, wrap up question. We talked about this last time. I'm curious as far as the personalities in the game and with where the game is heading, what do you guys think about showing up players as far as pimp jobs with home runs or when you're striking someone out? Um, both back in your day with, when you were playing with where things are at today, there's a lot of personality today, which is being really being shown. You know, like Tatis rounding third base, he does his jump skip mm -hmm. or flipping a bat. What are your thoughts on the way that the game is being played today? Um, I'll <laughs> give you, I mean, I have two different ways of looking at it. One, a, a personal example. I was a part of the team at the Blue Jays with the Bautista bat flip. And that, to me, that was the first bat flip, like extreme bat flip. Like I just did what I wanted to do. <laughs> And, you know, it happened and it was great and, you know, it became a meme and who knows what else. Um, but on the on the bus after that game, um, Bautista's sitting across the aisle with me and he taps me on the shoulder and he, and he asked me, he goes, did I do something wrong? Like, did I do that incorrectly? And I sat there for a second just to gather my thoughts how, how on it. How many years was he in at that time? Oh. He had 10 years? Oh, yeah. Him, oh, yeah. And I asked him, or I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm going, you've been playing this game your whole life. You've gone through who knows what, because he was a nobody and then turned into mm -hmm. a home run hitter. Who knows what he went through growing up, the trials that he had to go through to get to where he was, all the workouts, the injuries, the dieting, the sacrificing time with people that you love, all of it. Mm -hmm. And then you're on that stage, and in that moment, you do exactly what you're training for, for your whole life. So for you to be excited and to throw your bat like that, and if people want to get upset about that, they don't understand what went into that. They don't, they can't comprehend it. So maybe, you know, I remember 
Dyson on the other side, you know, started throwing at our guys after that. But, and I understand that side too, but as a player, if you are in that moment, in that specific moment, that kind of moment, and you come through like that, do whatever you want to do. I mean, that's what you play for. Mm -hmm. Now you're down 10 and you hit a three run homer. Now you're down seven and you do your little jump around third base. Like you should get one right in the ear hole the next time up for having no feel of the game of baseball. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I've, I've played on both sides. I've seen both and I, I can appreciate both. I like, I like holding each other accountable and, and treating the people that you're competing against the correct way. Like you're all professionals. You're the best on the planet at what you're doing. So act that way. You know, it's just the same as a guy who's striking somebody out and running out the field screaming and yelling. To me, that says he surprised himself. He didn't think he was going to get it done today. I was on the other side of that. I would just put my head down, be thankful inside, going, you got it, you got it done today, good job, and then go about my business. And I was never that. a screamer yeah. or yeller. I expected to do that today. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't, then I was a little surprised. Um, but that's kind of my perspective on all of that. You know, I'm, I'm a, probably essentially the same, and we might have a different way of saying it, but um, the excitement of doing something like hitting a home run it, that that that's exciting, okay. And you know, uh, uh, a knee-jerk reaction like a bat flip because you did something like that, I'm okay with that. It's the choreographed, planned out, thinking yeah. about trying to draw attention to yourself mm -hmm. instead of the game. That that that's 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 the problem <clears throat> I have with it. You know, I mean, I remember times when you you know you'd hit a ball and when it went over the fence, you you know you'd yell or you'd scream. And then you run around the bases and you get off the field. You know that was that was the way I did it. You know, um, I, I was not a, a bat flip guy. I mean, I hit the ball. I didn't hit a lot of homers anyway, and I didn't even know if they were going out half the time. So when I hit it, I ran because if it didn't go out, I was going to at least be on second. Sprint to first base. Yeah. You know? I know. I'm, I'm rounding. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm going to second. You know, because I. I mean, I'm just. That's the way I played. I, I. I remember getting to the big leagues and and you know you watch Matt Williams hit a home run and he ran around the base and I thought that was. I, I like the way he did that, you know. So that was the guy I used to watch hit homers a lot. And back then, that's what guys did. I mean, most guys didn't take their time around the bases, so that's not what I did. You know, you ran. But there were times where, <clears throat> you know, you'd get a big hit or you'd punch a guy out or you'd throw a guy out at second, and there was that burst, that release of, you know, oh, you know, I, it, and then, you know, it, it, that's it. You know, you don't, you don't spend the next – 10 minutes trying to think about how you're going to make yourself look good for doing something that you should have done anyway, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and that's where I have an issue more than anything. You know, the game, the, it, this is a tough game to play. So when you, when you do something well, I can see how energy can come out of you. It's the, it's the taking away from the game and putting the emphasis on yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the issue that I have with, with it. And that's not everybody. It's not everybody. But it's it's some it's some and, and and I don't watch it like I sh you know like I used to obviously and I'm sure that it's not you know the majority of guys aren't like that but um, you know this this game is bigger than any of us it, it was before us it's going to be after us um, there's guys that have played it that are way better than we ever were um, that are going to be better than everybody that's playing right now so you know let's give the game the respect that it deserves and, and treat it the way it's supposed to be treated. Get excited when you do well. Yeah. I get that. But I don't know. I, I, that, that's my philosophy on, on how the game should be played. And I don't, I don't know why that should change in 19, 20 years. I, I really don't. I, I don't see the game. Is a, it's a great game. It's been around for a long time. So I, I just think it deserves the utmost respect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grew up watching guys like you and McGuire and Sosa and the Killer Bees and just the way they went about King Kim and Eddie, the way they went about their business. Like that was that taught me how to act on a baseball field when I got the opportunity at the big league level. And I never forgot it. And I was in the clubhouse with those guys and I saw how they worked. I saw how they interacted and I wanted to be a part of that. And I just felt like it was the most respectful way to act to your opponent. And the game is not easy. And if, for me, it was such a humbling game. You know, you go out one day, you're screaming and yelling. What do you do the next night when you give up a walk-off homer? Yeah, right. It's like, so I always try to find that middle ground, like never too high, never too low. Yeah. Just kind of stay here, whether it's good or bad. Just know that you gave it your best that day. 
and leave it at the park with you because the next day is going to bring you something new. Yeah, you know, the, the guys that could do that, the John Olroods, he was the best. He was the best I ever saw at that. But those guys, the Matt Williams, those are the guys you, you watch. You're like, God, I wish I could be like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish it didn't affect me like it affected him. Yeah. You know, I, I just, the, the highs, the high, it's easy to, it, when, when you do something good and it's in the papers and it's on TV and, and people are patting you on the back, it's easy to let it get out of hand. But when things get bad, you don't want it to be in that. You don't want to be in that spot. That's right. But you're going to be in that spot, right? So let's try to keep it as even as we can. And you learn from guys that can do that. And I, I'm sure there are guys out there now that are like that. Oh, for sure. And I bet the guys that are like that are those. The, they they rub off on people. You know, they really do. And and they did back then, and I'm sure they do now. But those are the guys that I remember. Those are the guys that I wanted to be like. That's right. Yeah, baseball is the hardest sport out there. The hardest thing to do is to hit, to hit a baseball. Um, but it's like with anything in life, work hard, stay humble, try to stay as level as you can. Don't get too high, don't get too low, because as you mentioned, you might hit a home run, walk off home run one day, but if you go 0 for 4 with four strikeouts the next day, or you find a decline, you get injured, how are you going to deal with that low? That's right. So just try to stay as level as possible. I mean, right? even think about guys like Mike Trout. When his career is over, somebody's going to take a spot. Mm -hmm. We're all replaceable. The game continues to continue to go, mm -hmm. and you're setting the standard for everybody that's watching, mm -hmm. making sure that whatever good stuff you learned and picked up on from guys from your era and generation of players, that it continues to get passed down because, to me, that was the, the right way to play the game of baseball. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much of it is left, but I hope that some of the guys who have played with some older players are continuing to pass that down just to keep it going, but um, it all ends for everybody and, and there's always somebody ready to take your spot. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, Mark and Tom, really appreciate your time. Great conversation. Looking forward to the next one. Maybe get Jamie Moyer on at oh, some yeah. point. Have oh, a good yeah. conversation with him. For sure. But uh, thank you all that are listening. Make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.